Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Professor Delaray, for that, that introduction. Honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here tonight. And I will do my utmost best to teach you a little bit about welding tonight. I think most people here, even those of you who don't come from a technical background, would at least have had some exposure to welding. Um, even if it's just watching someone at your house well, the palisade fence or repair your burglar bars. Because most people have had some exposure to welding, I often get asked why I specialize in welding and why I work in welding. So thank you very much to the university for giving me the opportunity tonight to, to tell you why I work in welding and to give me a whole hour to expand on this because normally I have to answer the question in about five minutes. So thank you very much for this. Uh, for those of you who've seen someone at work at me, in your house doing a bit of welding, um, I would just like to explain that welding is a, is a lot more than just the normal handyman welding that you do at home. Welding over the last few years it has developed from what used to be almost an art to a very multidisciplinary science. And welding these, these days find application in very diverse fields. Uh, we're hearing a lot about welding in the in the power generation industry these days. It's a big part of the petrochemical industry. It features in the nuclear industry. It even features in the micro microelectronic industry where they often weld uh, very fine connectors in the microelectronic circuits. The science around welding, as I said, is also very multidisciplinary. It involves a lot of very advanced electronics for power source design. It involves very advanced non-equilibrium metallurgy. Um, these days we have the challenge that the steel mills and the alloy producers come up with all these wonderful advanced materials uh, that serve wonderful purposes in industry and then the welding people have to come up with ways of welding them. And we often lag a little bit behind the, the alloy producers in finding ways to successfully join these materials. Uh, there's also a lot of, of numerical modeling involved in welding these days where they're doing a very advanced modeling on trying to understand the residual stress state in welds, the uh, levels of distortion in welds. Uh, there's a lot of design aspects in welds, uh, a lot of mechanical design and, and um, structural design. So it's a field that encompasses a lot of different disciplines. So what I'd like to do tonight is just to explain to you why it's important to study welding and why we go to the effort at the University of Pretoria of, of doing research in the field of welding. Um, I'd like to do that on the basis of a few well-publicized failure cases that was directly re related to weld failures. Then I'd like to explain why welds tend to be susceptible to failure. So what, what is it about a weld that, that makes it prone to, to premature failure in industry? And then, then I'd like to just mention that it is still possible, despite all those features of welds that, le that lend them to premature failure, it is still possible to produce very good welds, provided that you follow certain recipes. So I'll explain to you what is required to produce a good quality weld, and I'd like to focus specifically on some new advances in energy sources or power sources for welds, just to explain to you how welds are being performed in industry at the moment. And then the big buzzword, of course, is skills. So I can't say anything about welding without mentioning welding skills. So if you'll allow me just to say a, word, a few words about that as well. Well, welding is still by far the most important means of joining metal components in, in industry. But welding is not just limited to metals and alloys. You can also weld plastics. Uh, you can weld ceramic materials, you can weld composites. So in any part of industry where there's any form of joining of materials involved, welding often plays a very important role. And the definition of welding includes not only the type of arc welding processes that most of you will be familiar with, but also a whole range of um, different energy sources that we can use for welds. Um, you can weld metals in the solid state without actually melting any of the materials. Uh, you can also braze or solder the materials. So all of those feature in the, the definition of welding. So just to start, I'd just like to 
mention a few very important failures. I have to start with the old Liberty Ship failures that many of you will, will be familiar with. This was probably the first really big case of welding failures reported in industry, where the United States in the, in the Second World War decided to start mass producing cargo ships and tanker ships. And they produced a vast number of these ships, um, all prefabricated ships that they welded together. And between 1941 and 1945, they produced 2,700 Liberty ships. And of those 2,700, there were uh, 1,500 reported cases of brittle failures. And in, if you just look at the Liberty ships, three of them actually broke in half without warning. And this is a typical example. This was uh, actually a, a T2 tanker called the SS uh, Schenectady that fractured in half. It was one day old at that stage. Um, it fractured in half in the harbor um, in cool, calm weather. And although there were a number of features that contributed to the failure of, of the ships, uh, many of the failures were due to the fact that they didn't understand how to position welds to minimize the risk of very high stresses. So in many cases, the failures were associated with very square or square uh, hatches built into the decks of the ships that coincided with welds. And when failure occurred, the continuous, long continuous weld seams provided very effective paths for the crack to, cracks to not run along. And um, there was a, of some very spectacular failures of, of some of these ships. Well, usually when there is a failure, at least we normally learn something from it. So it also uh, promoted the study field of welding. I'm trying to understand how a weld affects the, the materials, how we can often uh, accidentally embrittle a material when you, when you uh, perform welding. Just to bring things a bit closer to home, um, some of you may remember the very well publicized uh, failure of the roof over the uh, ice rink of the Colorado Shopping Center in 2001. And that failure was caused by the, the failure of the main roof girder that su supported the roof over the ice rink. There were, again, a number of contributing factors, but um, by and large, the failure was caused by the fact that the engineers who were involved in the design of the girder didn't understand the intricacies of, of the design of a welded structure. A structure like, like this, you would um, normally have to design very carefully. The welds have to, they have to be designed. Uh, a structure like this would preferably be manufactured mostly in a, in a controlled workshop environment where there are positioners and fixtures that can rotate the structure while you're welding so that you don't have to do a lot of uh, what we call positional welding, vertical welding or overhead welding, which tends to be a lot more difficult than flat or downhand welding. Instead, the, the girder was or produced on site and the welders had to do a lot of overhead and positional welding and many of the welds were actually very difficult to access. So some of the welds the welder couldn't actually reach. And it wasn't the welder's fault. It was, a, it was a design problem. And miraculously, in this case, no one um, was fatally injured, but it could have been a lot worse. Even more recently, there was the failure of the ship loader at the uh, Saldana Harbor iron ore terminal that was also uh, mentioned in, in, in the media. Uh, the so-called chip loader number two fractured at or failed at the, the iron ore terminal, and this is what an, an ore loader would typically look like. And when it fractured, it also damaged ship loader number, uh, number 1A. With, um, they only had two ship loaders, and uh, one was sort of a, just a for in case something happened to ship loader 2A. But the accident actually ended up damaging both shiploaders, and that led to the halting of the export of iron ore from South Africa for three weeks. So it had severe economic uh, repercussions. And again, the failures were mostly caused by bad welding and very bad workmanship in, in, in some of these cases. It's a tubular structure, and there's a typical example of a weld failure. Um, that bit there is, is the actual weld. So the, the failure was caused by very 
bad fusion, or what we call lack of fusion, between the actual weld metal and the base material. So the weld didn't, didn't melt into the base material ad adequately. And um, that led to the premature failure of many of the welds on, on the ship loader. So weld failures can have an enormous impact. Uh, catastrophic failures can cause loss of life. Um, it can have economic impacts. So it's very important that we understand welds, how they behave in industry, and what we can do to make sure that they don't fail, or don't fail within the lifetime of the, the uh, component at least. So that leads me to the next question. Why do welds fail? What, what, fee, what, what makes a weld more susceptible to failure in many cases than the surrounding base material? And there are a number of reasons for this, and I just want to highlight four of them. I'll go into a bit more detail now, but the first one listed there is geometric discontinuities. When you weld, you can normally see the weld. It's there. Uh, unless they grind the weld or somehow remove the, um, the reinforcing, you can normally see when something's been welded. And just that shape of the weld can actually cause very high stresses in the region of the joint. You can see there's a typical cross-section of a, what we call a groove weld, and just this change in shape in the region of the weld can lead to failure. Welds also result in microstructural changes, so a weld can change the internal structure of the material. And as the metallurgist here will know, uh, the microstructure, or the structure on a microscopic scale of a material, determines its properties to a large extent. So if you change the structure, you end up changing the properties as well. Welds also introduce residual stress. And I'll talk a bit more about, about this later, but we normally find very high tensile stresses in the region of a weld. And those stresses can add on to any externally applied stresses and end up um, exposed, exposing the weld to much higher stresses than you expect. And then last of all, welds are very susceptible to defects. So we often form defects in welds, and in many cases those defects can also accelerate failure. Let's take a look at them one by one. And if we first look at the geometric discontinuities, this is a, a cross-section of a, of a fairly nice weld. And just the fact that you add extra metal to the weld to produce the joint changes the shape and the cross-section of the material in the region of the weld. And it introduces these corners or angles um, at the surface of the, the plate material. And whenever you have a, a change in section thickness like that, it tends to concentrate the stress in that region. So we call those regions stress concentrations. And the fact that you concentrate the stress means that you can get very high peak stresses, and this often results in premature failure at those regions. So this is an example of a stress corrosion crack uh, in the stainless steel. This is a type of crack that develops when a metal is exposed to a corrosive environment at the same time as uh, being exposed to a stress. And you can see where that crack initiated. It's right at that corner between the weld metal or the weld, where the weld metal meets the base metal. And we call that the weld toe. And it's a very uh, important preferential crack initiation site. There's another example. This is a hydrogen crack crack caused by hydrogen absorption, and again it initiated at that weld toe region and then propagated all the way through the weld or through the metal. Now this is a problem even if the weld is a good looking weld, a nice smooth weld, but if you have a bad looking weld, the problem tends to get even worse. And this is a, a weld with a fairly poor profile. So if you look at a cross section, that transition between the weld region and the base material or the, the metal that we're welding, in this case is not nice and smooth. There's a sharp corner there at the weld toe and um, that concentrates the stresses. In this case there's a very nasty defect that we call undercut as well and this is an, a defect that forms when you uh, get little notches almost that form at the weld toe or the weld root which is usually associated with the welding parameters, and in this case that undercut or that notch that formed there also resulted in very fast crack initiation. Added to that, this weld is misaligned, 
So they're supposed to be, the two plates that you're joining are supposed to be in, on the same line there, and they're not. There's quite a gap or quite a bit of misalignment there. And if you stress that weld, it's loaded in practice, you can get bending stresses imposed on the structure, and that will also accelerate failure. So this is a nice example of what not to do. It's, also, it is possible to, to remove the excess weld metal there using a grinding process, for example. But you have to be very careful that you remove any defect that may extend into the material as well. Otherwise, you're still going to end up with a high stress concentration. Of course, welds result in microstructural changes. And this is where the whole issue of, of welding metallurgy comes in. And, and this is one of the big specializations of the university. Metals are very susceptible to changes in temperature. And we often make use of this fact by giving a metal a controlled heat treatment. So we can heat, uh, heat it up at a specific rate to a temperature, cool it down at a specific uh, rate, and that changes the properties by changing the internal structure. When you buy a metal from a metal producer, for example, it will typically be in the best heat treated condition. So they will make sure that the weld or that the metal that you're welding is, has the perfect properties. The moment you weld it, you really mess up the heat treatment condition. Especially with a typical arc weld like that. An arc weld, you heat up the metal to, to melting point in the weld, and then you cool it very fast. Typical weld microstructure, well, thermal cycles are extremely fast. And that fast cooling rate and the fact that metal melts and re-solidifies completely changes the internal structure. Um, this change in internal structure is not only limited to the metal that actually melts during the welding process, but there's also a band of metal next to the weld that also undergoes microstructural changes. Because when you're welding, you're putting a lot of heat into the metal, and that heat will tend to heat up the whole region around the weld. And even the parts that don't melt will still be heated to very high temperatures and that changes the microstructure. So we often refer to the bit that melt, melts during the weld thermal cycle as the weld metal or the composite zone, and the region around it that suffers microstructural changes as the heat affected zone. And we need to be concerned about what happens in, in both of those regions. But these are two typical examples of microstructures. Um, this first one is a so-called electron backscatter diffraction pattern or, or image, which is just a, um, a way of, of saying that it's an electron microscope image where the different colors in this case represents different grain orientations. Metals consist of grains, and those grains have specific sizes, they have specific structures and, and shapes, and they have a very big influence on what actually happens in the world. This is the base material. You can see it's a very fine grain size, sort of rounded grains. But in the world, the grains get extended and they grow as very long columnar grains. And that affect the affects the properties. This is a, an example of a duplex stainless steel weld. This is the weld metal itself. That's the base metal. And the part in between is the heat affected zone. The stuff that's colored blue in this case um, represents a different phase from the, the white material. And in metallurgy, we refer to phases as parts of the internal structure of the material that may have different chemistries and different crystal structures. So in this case, the blue part and the white part have different crystal structures. And you can see how the weld changes the internal structure. It's a lot more white material in the weld than in the rest of the plate material, and that affects the properties quite badly. So as metallurgists, we need to control these microstructural changes. This is a typical example of some work that we did um, recently in collaboration with the CSIR, where we looked at the welding of a very special material, or material that was very sp produced in a very special way, it's a so-called aluminium alloy 7017. 
It's a medium strength aluminium alloy that's used for a lot of armor plate applications and for lightweight bridges. It's alloy, the aluminium is mixed with magnesium and zinc to get the required properties. And this is an alloy that is not normally amenable to casting. Casting is a way that we use to produce almost final shaped products by melting the metal and then pouring it into a mold. Now this alloy tends to crack when you, when you cast it. Um, but there's a new well, a fairly new technology called semi-solid metal processing where they actually cast the metal in a semi-solid state. So you melt the metal, allow it to partially solidify, and then you put it through a high-pressure die caster, and then you can actually cast this alloy quite nicely. And you get a microstructure that consists of these big sort of whitish grains that's aluminium rich, and the dark particles in between is what we call an intermetallic phase, but it's a fairly complex mixture of aluminium, zinc, and magnesium. When you weld it, you completely change this internal structure. And this was a laser weld that was deposited um, thanks to my colleagues from the laser center who's sitting there in the back, um, where we just remelted the surface. So we didn't even add any extra metal, it was just remelting. And the very fast cooling rates associated with laser welding changed the structure. You still have the same phases essentially, but it's a much finer structure. And that changes the properties. This is a a hardness profile across the weld where we measured the hardness of the material and you can see the, the increase in the hardness in the weld metal that was caused just by this very fine structure that developed due to the fast cooling rates of the laser weld. Another example is uh, one that we've been working on for quite a while and um, this is uh, low chromium stainless steels. Uh, low chromium in the case of a stainless steel would typically be in the region of uh, maybe 11, 12% of, of chromium, maybe 13%. Typical chromium content would be about 18%. So these are low chromium stainless steels and we look specifically at a steel known as 409. And this is a steel that's used extensively in uh, exhaust systems. So the pure cast catalytic converter, uh, some of the mufflers, some of the tubing, uh, silences tend to be manufactured out of, out of this particular material. It's welded a lot in industry, so you can see a lot of welds on this, on this structure. And this metal is susceptible to excessive grain growth. So the internal grains in the material tend to grow to very large sizes due to the heat of welding. And there is a, a recommendation, or these weld, or this material is usually welded with very low heat levels. So you limit the amount of heat that goes into the metal to make sure that the grains don't grow too, too big. And this is the industry sort of standard, uh, the low heat input welding, but we started getting concerned about the corrosion resistance of this particular material because it is subjected to corrosion in the, in the exhaust system. And we wanted to look at the effect of these heat inputs, the, the heat that you actually put into the metal on, on the welds. And this is just a temperature profile that shows you what temperatures and what cooling rates the actual metal next to the weld experiences at different heat input levels. And what it shows is that the lower the heat input, or the heat that you put into the weld, the faster it cools down, which is a, a general weld sort of relationship. And what we found is that the very fast cooling rates that are associated with the low, in, or low heat, heat input welding can cause serious corrosion issues. This is what the material next to the weld looks like. So you can see the grains. The grains are quite coarse. That bar there is about half a millimeter. So in, in metallurgy terms, this would be a very coarse grain size. And if you look at a higher magnification of this structure, if you look carefully, you'll see that there's something on these grain boundaries. Um, and these particles that sit there are so-called chrome carbides, chrome carbides. And these carbides can affect the corrosion resistance of the welds quite badly, or in this case, the heat affected zone. And if you expose that weld to a corrosive environment, the grain boundaries tend to get corroded preferentially. So you can see how the grain boundaries were actually eaten away by the corrosion, corrosive environment. And this can lead to some of these metal grains actually falling out. 
So it's a, it's a serious concern when you start getting corrosion issues on welds due to the weld thermal cycle. Welds also re result in residual stress, and residual stress is caused by the fact that when you weld something, you heat it up, and when you heat the metal up, it tends to expand, and when it cools down, it contracts, and if the metal is constrained by the surrounding or the weld is constrained by the surrounding plate material and it's not free to expand and contract the way you would want to, you end up leaving stresses in the material. And this is a, a residual, measured residual stress profile in a carbon steel weld that was measured with neutron diffraction techniques. And this part shown there in red is, represents the peak tensile residual stresses me measured in the weld. So there are extremely high stresses in the weld and this is even before you start putting any load or any stress on the material. And it's estimated in carbon steel welds that those residual stresses can be as high as the, the yield point of the material. So uh, you actually stress the material up to the point where it starts deforming under the level of, of stress. There's another example of these very high tensile residual stresses that you get in welds. And it means that when you stress that weld, the stress that you add externally in a structure, for example, will just add on to the stresses already in the material, and it can lead to very high levels of stress um, that you may not even be aware of. Of course, weld defects. Uh, it is possible to produce defect-free welds, but most welds will contain at least some form of defect. These are just a few examples. This is a slag inclusion where a bit of the slag during the welding process became trapped by the weld. This is lack of fusion where the weld itself didn't melt into the, the base material. There's a nice centerline crack that's caused by the solidification process. And this is a rather extreme example of some porosity or gas bubbles in the weld metal where gases dissolve in the, in the weld during the welding process and when the weld re re-solidifies, the gas don't want to be in solution anymore, and it tends to bubble out. And when you trap those bubbles, you end up with these big holes in the, in the welds. And all of these defects can act as stress concentrations. So you can get very high peak stresses around any of those defects, and it can accelerate failure. So that's the bad news. The question now is, how do we actually go about producing a decent weld, something that survives? And there are a few things that you need to consider, and uh, I'll try to make a bit of a list of them. Before you weld something, you need to prepare the base material or the metal that you're welding. So you just you can't just weld anything, you need to prepare it. And this may include so-called joint preparation, where we may have to just machine the edges of the joint before we weld to make sure that we melt all the way through. If you don't melt all the way through, you end up with something that looks like a crack anyway. So sometimes we just open up the joint, especially with thick plates, to make sure that you can reach all the way down into the root of the material. Cleaning is very important. Um, if you weld over something that's heavily oxidized or dirty, covered with oil or grease or paint, you will end up contaminating the weld when some of those compounds dissociate in the, the welding arc and they can get absorbed by the weld metal. And then what we call fit up. Well, that means you have to place the, the metals in position before you weld them and you have to make sure that they stay in position. So this is an example of a nozzle weld on a pressure vessel. It's been placed in position, supported, and um, they've taken measures to make sure that this gap that you usually leave when you uh, start, start welding uh, remains constant. Once you've prepared the metal, you have to weld it. And part of that means you have to choose some kind of welding process. And I'll explain a bit more about energy sources um, in the next few slides. You also have to choose some filler metal or welding consumable, because when you have a gap like that, you have to fill it up with something. And you fill it up by a welding electrode that would typically melt down during the welding process and it forms your, your eventual weld. And the selection of that consumable can be critical because you need something that's 
compatible with the metal that you're welding. And when you weld, you have to protect the metal from contamination. Hot metal, and especially molten metal, tends to be very reactive towards the, the atmosphere. So the oxygen and the nitrogen that we have in air can react with the metal while it's hot, and that can really destroy the properties in many cases. Uh, you form oxides or nitrides in the welds. Um, you can form porosity in the welds. So we need to protect the metal in some way, and there, there are a number of, of methods. Um, you can use a flux or a slag, and those of you who may, may have done a bit of stick welding will know what I mean by that. It's usually compounds you add to the weld process that form a layer of slag that floats on top of the liquid weld metal and shields it from the, from the atmosphere. You can use a gas, so you can use an inert gas like argon or helium that doesn't react with the metal to displace the atmosphere. Uh, you can weld in vacuum, there are certain processes that operate in vacuum. Um, so you need to protect the metal until it's cooled down sufficiently that you can expose it to the atmosphere. And then of course you need skilled welding personnel. It's not always easy to produce a good weld and welders need to be trained to understand the welding process and to have the necessary skills and that's a big issue in this country at the moment. Once you have all these ingredients, uh, you have to mix them together in a, like, almost a kind of recipe. And what you really need is something called a weld procedure specification. And this is a document, usually a two or three page document, that explains exactly how the weld should be done. So it explains all these features, what type of parameters you have to use, what filler materials, how you have to pre prepare the weld, how many passes you need. So it's like a recipe that tells the welder exactly what he needs to do to complete the weld. And this is a bit that many people actually forget. Um, for the, so any critical weld, you need a procedure specification. And that procedure specification has to be qualified. And that means you have to prove that the procedure actually works. And that's usually done by performing tests before you do the actual production weld where you make a, a sample of the weld, for example, following that recipe described in your procedure specification, and then you put it through extensive testing. You do a bend test, typically, a tensile test, where you pull the sample of the weld apart, you look at the internal structure and the hardness, and that tells you whether your, your recipe actually works. And only then can you apply that recipe in industry. So let's take a closer look at two of these features. The, the one that I would like to just talk about is, is energy sources for welding. Just to show you what's been happening in the, in the field of welding in terms of, of power source design specifically, and in the issue of, of welding skills. Now there are a number of energy sources that you can use to produce a weld. To get bonding between the metals, you need to apply some form of energy. And the one that most people are familiar with is the electric arc. So that's the process you would typically use when you're welding your burglar bars or your new bry at home. It's the one that produces the very bright light that can really cause damage to your eyes if you're not careful. And it's a very popular welding method because the arc gives you a very intense heat, so, uh, or very intense heat. Um, an arc is essentially just a discharge, electrical discharge between two electrodes. So you have a, a negatively charged electrode and a positively charged electrode connected to the power source. And um, by applying a potential difference between the, the two electrodes, you can um, ionize the gas column. So that's essentially gas that's been changed into its ion form. So some of the gas atoms and molecules lose their electrons and some gain electrons. And that makes this... The, the gas column between the electrodes conductive. And the beauty of an electric arc is that you can really generate very high temperatures. If you look at a, at a schematic of the process, you have your two electrodes. One will be the plate that you're welding and one will be the electrode itself. That's the arc column. And depending on how you set up the machine, you can get temperatures up to 4,000 degrees Celsius right next to the actual plate that you're welding. And if you look at the arc itself, 
A welding arc can have temperatures below the arc of up to 50,000 Kelvin, which is very close to 50,000 degrees Celsius. This is a fairly low current gas tungsten arc weld, and you can see the maximum temperature just below the electrode is about 16,000 Kelvin or, or close to 16,000 degrees Celsius. It's a very high energy heat source, and that's why we can use it to weld almost anything except very low melting point metals because they tend to vaporize from the weld when you start uh, when you use an arc. Now if you look at the way we produce an electric arc, most power sources very simply stated are step down transformers. So you take the input uh, that you get from ESCOM usually, which is an alternating current 50 watt hertz that you put into the, the transformer and by varying the number of coils between your, in your primary and secondary um, uh, parts of the transformer, you can determine what type of output voltage you, you get. And the idea is to change the, the high voltage, low current input to a low voltage, high current output. Simply speaking, um, this is the very the basics of a welding power source, but this is not really the way to do it. <laughs> so, um, quite a number of safety issues there. Um, but that's not the way we do it anymore. Well, thank goodness. There's been a number of very interesting advances in power source development recently, uh, which makes the power sources much lighter, much smaller, and much easily controlled. Um, the first one shown there is inverter technology. And those of you who have done a bit of welding at home, especially a few years ago, will remember the old power sources. They tended to be big, bulky, heavy power sources with a transformer inside. And to cool the transformer, in many cases, they were oil cooled. You can now get these little inverter power sources that are about this size. And they weigh about two or three kilograms, maybe. And they give you the same output as those really big transformers. And for the people who may be interested in electronics, I won't go into a lot of detail, but what they do to get the transformer that small is they take the AC current from the, the mains, rectify it to form DC or direct current. So AC gives you a, a, a sine wave output. You rectify that to give you a more constant DC output, direct current output. You filter that to give you a very smooth constant current output and then you take that and you put it through a, through an inverter which changes it, ba it back to an AC waveform, alternating current waveform. But instead of having your 50 or 60 hertz input, you change it to the kilohertz cycle. So you increase the frequency of the alternating current and that you put through the transformer. And by changing the frequency of the, uh, of the input to the transformer, you can minimize, you can shrink the transformer. So you can end up with using a you end up using a much smaller transformer and the output is now your low voltage high amperage output that you need for welding. You can rectify that to get a nice smooth DC output if you want. And if you really have a good power source, you can change it back to AC but a very controlled AC output where you can actually vary the the entire output of the machine. So that's how they minimize the power sources. To give you another quick example, um, waveform form control. When we do gas metal arc welding, which is a process where it's an arc welding process where you use a wire electrode that gets fed continuously into the weld pool. With this process, we can control how the molten metal droplets transfer across the arc because this electrode melts down, and the molten metal needs to go from through the arc into the weld pool. And one of the ways this, can, this is typically done is so-called short-circuiting transfer, where the metal droplet forms at the tip of the electrode wire as it melts down. It extends towards the workpiece of the weld pool, and at some point it actually makes contact. So it forms a short circuit. And at, at that point, your welding current tends to go up, over there, and eventually the, elect, or the droplet so the, the neck of the electrode contracts. It's a bit like watching a, a water droplet fall from your bathtub. Pretty much the same principle. But the, the, the neck of the, the molten droplet contracts, 
and eventually the droplet falls into the pool. It's a very good way of, of welding steels, um, but it is associated with a lot of spatter. So what, what they've done is um, one of the big welding companies have actually looked at this process to see where most of the spatter generates. And they've developed a power source that can switch the current levels very quickly to minimize spatter. So the power source, uh, the, the droplet forms at the tip of the electrode, it extends towards the workpiece, it makes contact. The current goes up because you're forming a short circuit. The electrode or the tip of the electrode starts necking or contracting and then the power source senses when the droplet is about to detach. And when it's about to detach, the power source drops the current down very quickly. And instead of the droplet falling into the whirlpool, it gets pulled into the whirlpools through surface tension. And that reduces a lot of the spatter. And this happens about 200 times a second. So you have a very rapid response power source. And um, let's see if this thing works. These are very high speed video images of what actually happens in the arc. Uh, video, high speed video with laser backlighting and you can see the actual droplet forming at the tip of the electrode. It extends, at some point it touches the workpiece and then it just gets pulled in to the, to the, um, to the world pool. And you have a very controlled, very, um, uh, very nice power source that gives you very good properties. Just a few words on, on other processes. We don't have to use a welding arc to, to weld. Anything that creates heat can weld. So we can use something like electrical resistance. When you pass current through a conductor, it tends to heat up because there's electrical resistance. And this process is the one that they use to weld most of the car body panels. It's a process very good, it's very good for thin plate welding, where you actually overlap the plates that you want to join. You use some water-cooled copper electrodes, you pass a current through that, those electrodes, and if you control the process correctly, the greatest resistance to the flow of current will be between the plates, and you can get localized melting, and it forms a little puddle of molten metal between the plates that forms a spot weld. And um, the amount of heat generated is proportional to the welding current that you use squared, and you can go up to 20,000 amps with this process, so it's a very rapid, fast welding process. Another example, you can use radiation energy for welding. And laser welding is becoming very popular. It's where you use an actual laser, very focused laser beam to weld. And if you set up the process correctly, you can get these very deep, narrow welds. Uh, this is in 12 millimeter thick plate. And this is done by focusing the, the, the laser in a specific way so that you actually vaporize some of the metal from the joint the laser penetrates very deeply into the plate and it gives you the capabilities, capability of producing these very deep, narrow welds. It has the disadvantage, though, that your plates need to be very well aligned before you start welding them. So your fill-up has to be perfect. And you need, you'll normally need machine edges. So one of the newer variations of the process is called hybrid welding, where you combine a laser beam and a, and a welding arc to give you uh, uh, as a weld that's less sensitive to spit up. So you actually aim the laser beam and the arc into the same weld pool. The laser gives you the deep penetration and the arc tends to give you a, a wider weld bead that's less sensitive to dilution. And this is a process that's seeing a lot of development at the moment. Well, the, the one that many of you will probably know, you don't even need electricity to weld anything. You can use a chemical reaction. If you use the right chemical reaction, you can generate a lot of heat. And this is a typical example, oxy fuel gas welding, oxyacetylene welding, where you have a torch where you mix oxygen and acetylene in a specific ratio. You ignite that mixture and it forms a flame. And that flame temperature can be more than 3,000 degrees Celsius. And that's more than enough heat to, to, to weld steel. So it's a process that's very nice for field repairs where you may not have access to an electrical power source. One quick um, reminder, you don't even have to melt anything to weld, to weld metals together. And this is a process where we use pressure or deformation to form a solid state weld. 
uh, this example, there are several of them, but this example is called friction welding. And it's a way of joining shafts or axles, for example, anything with a, a round cross section. And the way it's done is you will clamp the two parts that you would like to, to join in the machine. One of them is held stationary and the other one is rotated at a high speed. And then you bring them together. And the rotation of the one part then causes friction at the interface. That friction causes heating, so the interfa interface between the parts start heating up, but not to the melting temperature, so you stay in the solid state. And when the interface reaches the melting temperature, you force the two parts together, and the softening that you get as a result of the heating then allows the two metals to deform and to form a solid state weld. And it's a very nice quick way of joining thick axles or shafts in, in one movement. Just to give you an example of some of the work that we've been doing, um, this is an example where we looked at a brazing technique for repairing nickel-based super alloy, alloy turbine blades. And just to give you a, a quick overview, a super alloy is an alloy where we mix different types of metals together, sometimes up to 15 or 20 different metals together, to get an alloy that can operate at 75% or higher than its melting temperature, continuously over long periods of time. Most metals can't do that. They degrade when you use them at high temperatures. Um, so the, the nickel-based super alloys that they use in the high temperature parts of, of turbine engines, this is what they would look like under a microscope. And the reason why they survive at those high temperatures, if you look at a much higher magnification image, are these little square thingies in there. And those are so-called gamma prime precipitates or nickel-3 aluminum titanium precipitates. They're extremely small. That bar there is one micron. That's a thousandth of a millimeter. So they are very small, but they give you a very, very good high temperature strength. The problem with these nickel-based super alloys is that they cannot be well repaired. So if you have a turbine that suffered damage during service, you can't weld repair those turbines and they're extremely expensive. So there is an incentive to use a, a, a process to repair any form of crack that may develop. And this is a typical, typical example of a type of cracks, they're usually thermal fatigue cracks, a very fine network of small cracks that can develop. But you can't weld them. So in industry they use a brazing technique where brazing is a form of joining where you don't melt the substrate material. So you use a lower melting point filler material that you melt into the joint um, without melting any of the surrounding base materials. And to do that, you need to decrease the melting temperature of the braze alloy. So they use nickel base alloys where they add a bit of boron just to drop the melting temperature so that you can braze with them. And it works very well in aerospace applications. So in, in aircraft turbine engines, normally they do good maintenance, well, I should hope so, so they find the cracks very quickly. So the cracks tend to be very narrow. But in land-based turbines, like in the power generation industry, the cracks sometimes grow a bit wider before they actually find them. And then you can't use a straightforward braze technique, because if you use a, a, a boron-based braze alloy, you form these little black things in there, and those are borite phases that embrittle the joint. So we developed a technique with, uh, together with General Electric Energy Services in the United States, where we combined a novel brazing technique, where instead of just feeding the braze filler metal into the joint, you feed a mixture of braze filler metal and some super alloy powder particles into the joint. So instead of having a wide open joint, you're actually just brazing the gaps between the particles. And we combined that with a newly developed braze alloy, where instead of using boron, we used hafnium as a, as a melting point depressant. And this process was so successful that the braze joints outperformed all the current commercially, commercial repair techniques. Uh, some of the braze joints were actually stronger than the base material. And the process is now applied in the United States as an accepted repair technique for some of the land-based turbines. So this is some of the developments we've been doing on the process side. 
I, as I said, I can't leave without saying something about the skills, but, um, because that's been in the news a, a great deal. You may remember in April and May last year, there was some labor unrest at the uh, Madupi and Kosili construction sites where ESCOM is building the, the new uh, coal-powered power stations. And what you may not know is that welding is critical in those power plants. There are up to, well, tens of thousands of highly critical welds in, in those power stations. And the welders were upset, or the South African welders were upset because there were large numbers of Thai and, and Philippine welders imported to do the actual welding. And part of the reason for this problem is the fact that we still have a skill shortage in South Africa. And um, although government and the private sector have been quite successful at raising, or, or uh, raising the number of, of, of colleges and training facilities in the country, um, we still have a skills, sh a skills shortage. Uh, government has introduced the Accelerated Learners or Artisan Scheme to try and get more artisans into industry. But there are some problems because in many cases the, the people doing the training are not adequately qualified. Um, there are problems um, in the sense that when the, the, the welders are, are tested for, for big projects, in many cases um, the, uh, most of the welders don't actually pass the, 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 the tests. And many of the people who pass through the system have a bit of a credibility issue when they end up on the on uh, at the plants. Um, many of the big companies are not completely satisfied with the level of training, so um, there, there is still a, an issue around the actual artisan training in the country. We also have a big shortage of high-level engineering skills in the welding industry. And a lot of the engineers, or most of the engineers we produce in this country, don't really have an, a, a good understanding of the, the intricacies of, of welding, especially the more advanced materials. And just to give you an illustration, um, the International Welding Engineer Qualification is an international qualification, postgraduate qualification for training welding engineers. And since 2006, we've only trained 22 international welding engineers in the country. And if you compare that to Germany, Germany trains about 500 a year. So we're lagging well behind the uh, more industrialized countries in terms of training highly skilled welders. So what we need is some kind of a training scheme that is accepted by government and industry uh, where learners are trained by knowledgeable trainers and learners are trained according to a creditable program or a credible program. Um, what I need to add as well is that well, well, the training of welding and personnel is highly, highly regulated in, in internationally. So it's a bit different from many other fields. And this is due to the fact that the welding industry is highly regulated. So welding is performed in industry according to codes and standards and specifications. And those codes and standards and specifications have very clear guidelines on what is, what is considered a credible, a credible training program or certification program. So we need to satisfy the requirements of these big international programs or codes and standards qualification and certification schemes. Otherwise, the welding we're doing in the country may not comply to code requirements. And if you're building boilers and pressure vessels, that can become a, a major issue. The good news is that there is a very good system available internationally that's also already in place in South Africa. So internationally, there is a, a training program that covers all levels of welding personnel, from the practitioner was essentially a highly trained welder, to the specialist, who was a supervisor more, the welding inspector, the technologist, and finally the, the qualified international welding engineer. This is a program that's currently accepted by 55 member countries of the International Institute of Welding internationally, including all the big industrialized countries, and the training system is um, is controlled very rigorous, rigorously, so the, the programs are, um, or the, the syllabus for each of the training programs have been developed and tested internationally, and you have to satisfy very strict requirements to be able to present a program like this. But it's completely internationally accepted. And it's the only 
certification and training program for welding personnel that is accepted internationally at the moment. Um, we've partnered with the Southern African Institute of Welding to make sure that all of these programs are presented in South Africa. So the Southern African Institute of Welding, with some of the approved training bodies, um, present the first four, and then with uh, under we've just recently been fully accredited by the International Institute of Welding to present the welding technologist and the welding engineer qualifications. And these are postgraduate qualifications that we present as part of our honors programs. So to get onto the International Welding Engineer program, you need to be an engineer, number one. To get onto the Welding Technologist program, you have to have a, a degree in technology, a B-Tech degree or a BSc degree. And it, we present it in the form of four on-campus lecture weeks where we focus on processes, welding metallurgy, design, where we look at, at both dynamic and static design, and then fabrication engineering where we look at all the major welding codes and specifications. We supplement that by uh, training material that was developed in Germany just to satisfy the, the uh, contact time requirements for, of the International Institute of Welding. And we have a 60-hour practical training. And once you go through all of this and you complete it successfully, you can get uh, an honours in engineering and your International Welding Engineer Diploma or a BSc Honours in Applied Science, Welding Technology plus your International Welding Technologist Diploma depending on what your, your initial qualification was. So that's where we fit in, and I'd like to just end by saying um, what we are, just giving you an indication of what we are doing at the university at the moment. We uh, launched this SRW Center for Welding Engineering at the end of last year, with sponsorship from the Southern African Institute of Welding. And the aims of the center are to, number one, train more internationally qualified engineers and technologists on the postgraduate level and also to grow our research activities. The university has been active in welding related research for almost 20 years now. But we want to grow that, get more students in and grow the program so that we can satisfy the needs of industry. We need to introduce the new technologies, we need to introduce the, the, the new materials and, and help industry adapt those new processes and materials uh, for everyday or for their welding activities. And these are the people who are involved. It's myself, Professor Baldur Stumpf, who is with it, our, our department, who assists with a lot of lecturing. Professor Nick Dacker is somewhere in the audience from Civil Engineering, who helps us with some of the design modules. We've recently appointed Nellis van Niekert as a part time research assistant. And then we have Professor Michael Redmeyer from the Technical, Technical University in Berlin in Germany who is uh, an extraordinary professor in the, in the department who will also be assisting with a lot of the lecturing on the program. So that's what we do, so if you have any welding related issues or questions, I hope you know where to go now. Thank you very much. <laughs>